I'm Tony Coppola. Hello to Click Polo from the USPA. Hi, I'm Bob Putz, CEO of the USPA, and I'm here with Click Polo. Estamos en Argentina, en Palermo. Antes de hablar del polo de Estados Unidos, viniste muchas veces acá a Palermo. ¿Cuál es tu historia con, con esta cancha? Well, I've been coming here for 35 or 6 years, and it's always a big this is the Mecca of polo, so it's always great to come and see the best polo in the world. ¿Cuál era tu equipo favorito cuando venías a jugar, cuando venías a mirar los primeros partidos? ¿Qué equipo te gustaba? My favorite team now? No, in or the for the past. I think everybody's favorite team was uh, Colonel Suarez. But of course I was very close with Cacho Merlo, so when Santana won in 1982, I was very happy to be here and see them win the, that year. No, the, the equipo of Colonel Suarez was the two Hagies and the two Harriots was yeah. primero. But uh, and they were like La Delfina and uh, Elestina are today. They're dynasties. But uh, siempre todos los políticos <coughs> se preguntan cómo saldría un partido entre Coronel Suárez de los dos Egi y los dos Harriot contra La Delfina. You know, it's a different kind of polo. Uh, the polo back then was the classic polo. It was up and down the field, a lot of passing. Now there's still a lot of passing, but it's very, muy rápido. ¿Te gustaba más el polo de antes o el de ahora? You know, I'm adapting to, I like this polo now, I think. But there was a time when I thought that, uh, I remember back, back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, when the, uh, the Hagee twins were starting to play, and everybody said, oh, they've changed the game. And then you thought that they were changing the game. Now the game has changed. They've, they've left them behind and it's even quicker and faster now. O sea, como espectador, preferís ver un partido hoy y no hace 30 años, acá en la tribuna. <coughs> no, I think, I think uh, back then it was my first taste of big polo, so I enjoyed that. But I think now, uh, uh, the horses now are just spectacular. Maybe they don't play as long, but they play very good, very fast, very hard. Un caballo de hace 30 años podría jugar al polo hoy? No, it's different. The horses uh, 30 years ago were were schooled and and played a different at a different rate of speed. That's why they could play a horse three chuckers in those days. But claro, antes jugaban todo el chucker los caballos. Sí. But now I don't think the horses are, the horses are fit, but they're a different fit. They're fit to go quick, hard, take a rest, come back. Whereas before they, they were more for uh, much más tiempo, for a longer time. Eh, eh, un tiempo atrás no era ni siquiera pensable o imaginable el tema de los clones. ¿Qué opina de los clones? Uh, it's, I guess it's like everything else, it's the 21st century, I am, I'm still, I'm still, uh, it's hard for me, to, it's hard for me to, to think that one mare can have 10 babies in one year or 20 babies, you know. Uh, I guess maybe because I'm involved with racehorses, so in the racehorses, because it must be a live cover, no, no uh, uh, cloning, no, no uh, uh, embryos. So when you think of one mare, the mare has 10 or 12 babies and that's all she has. And here you can have uh, 10, 10 polo ponies from the same mare, the same year, the same uh, stallion. The same it's, clone. Uh, and plus cloning. Yeah, no, it's... Is it good for the polo? I, I, I guess so. Uh, I guess so. Uh, I think it's bad for business, for people who... Uh, who are training and selling horses. I mean, I think, uh, you know, it's always the challenge of taking a horse and making it from just a horse to a great polo pony. Eh, siendo Estados Unidos, ¿cómo ve el polo hoy en Estados Unidos? 
Well, I think with the lowering the polo to 22 goals, we have more more people competing at our at our open. Uh, you know, there is another group that's playing 26 goal polo, which is is great. Uh, it's it's the best polo played anywhere except for Argentina. Uh, so at 22 goals, we're equal with England, uh, but we have more people competing, so maybe maybe it's better. Uh, por ahora parece que va a ser una gran temporada, ¿no? Con, con esta división de la Liga de 26 y los torneos de 22. Parece haber más equipos. Yes, yes, because there's now 16 teams at the 22 goal level and six teams at the 26 goal level. So that's 22, 22 teams. It's a lot of polo. El polo de Estados Unidos parece estar bastante bien, sólido. El, el polo bajo. Estados Unidos es el país que más jugadores tiene y más clubes. Es un país con muchos habitantes. ¿Cómo se hace para que el polo crezca desde, desde la base, desde abajo? That's that's the thing. You know, we have a lot more logo polo than we ever did before. I mean, for for many years, uh, in the USPA we had 12 goal tournaments and then eight goal tournaments. Now we have two goal tournaments, four goal tournaments, six goal tournaments. So there's more more polo at the lower end, and like everything else, you hope that people start at that level and they can grow to the higher levels. ¿Te piensas que el polo debería crecer más todavía o está creciendo a buen? I don't I don't know if it's more polo, but uh, it's coming back. I mean, we, we, we had a good resurgence in polo in the, in the 80s, then the 90s went down a little bit, 2000, now it's coming back again. Eh, la Federación Internacional de Polo va a tener un nuevo presidente, Horacio Areco. Le hice una entrevista y él decía que tiene que haber más polo de todo tipo. Polo en arena, polo de mujeres, polo bajo techo. Eh, no, we, we are we're experiencing the same thing. Arena polo is getting bigger, bigger again. Uh, women's polo is very, very big. Uh, I mean, right now this week you have the women's open here. We just finished our women's open in, in Texas. Uh, in the United States Polo Association, the population of women are about 40, 40 plus percent. They're, they're gaining with the men. En Argentina eh, hay un debate en cuanto al polo porque se trata que Palermo tenga más espectáculo, que no quede solo lo que pasa en la cancha. ¿Usted piensa que el polo solo con lo que pasa en la cancha es suficiente para atraer a más gente? No, I think uh, I think everybody feels that if we do more commercialism into polo that will bring it more to the masses. Uh, but the big problem is to have more people understand polo. Here in Argentina, you already have uh, people with the mentality to understand polo. That's why you come to Palermo and there's no announcer. People play, the, the fans see a good play, they clap. If they see a bad play, they boo. If they think the umpire should have blown the whistle, they all whistle because they understand it more. Uh, a funny thing happened today. My son and I were watching today's game and there was a group of Americans behind us that had seen some polo in the States and this was a big difference for them. But yet, they were not being educated on what it was. They were, you know, they were talking amongst themselves and saying, oh, I guess that's a foul, the umpire blew the whistle, you know? So, part of the commercialism is to, to make people more aware of what is going on in the game. Otra cosa que pasa acá en Argentina, hay gente que piensa que el polo tiene que ser más popular y gente que piensa que no, que el polo es para una clase más alta. ¿Qué piensa con respecto a Estados Unidos? No, we have this we have the same same thing in the United States. I mean, it's like now uh, we're trying to commercialize by by showing on television the high goal polo and 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 with the understanding or with the idea that if you see the best players you see the best polo and then it will trickle down to the lower polo uh you know it's very hard to to take and try to commercialize six goal polo eight goal polo maybe you know and when you compare it with 22 or 26 or 20 
because the players hit the ball longer, they make more plays, the game is more fluid. Eh, la mayoría de la gente acá en Argentina, en la calle, eh, no sabe lo que es el polo. La mayoría de la gente en Estados Unidos conoce de polo. No como las personas aquí. Como he dicho, aquí puedes tener un juego sin un anunciador, sin decirles nada. Aquí la única cosa que te dices a los espectadores es qué jugadores de los jugadores están jugando. Y eso es todo. Quiero decir, si miras los juegos de polo en ESPN, en 8 chuckles de polo, solo te muestran el score de polo tres veces. Pero en el scoreboard tienes el equipo de los equipos de los equipos. So people know who's playing one, who's playing two, who's playing three. But uh, here you don't do that because the people already know, I think, or they, they feel that they understand enough that you don't have to show them that. But for people outside the polo, do you think that maybe Americans know a little bit about the sport or don't they even know? know what polo is in general outside? Uh, of not as much as here in Argentina. I don't think the people understand in the United States I mean, here you are, I mean, football is your, soccer is your number one sport and, and polo is probably number two or three, maybe racing is right up there with it, but I think, I think more people, when you pick up the newspaper here, they know who, who the Hagies are, who the Pietas are, who Adolfo Cambiaso, they know because they're sports figures. Uh, you know, I've seen here where I picked up the newspaper and the headlines mention Cambiaso or Pieres or uh, Guamanero but, and people understand what that is. You know, you don't have to say the polo players are this just put their name and the people know that they're polo players. ¿Y qué habría que hacer para que los diarios de Estados Unidos hablen más del polo de Estados Unidos? You know, I don't know. We, we, when I was involved in, in running polo clubs We always made sure that we had a relationship with the newspapers. We advertised in the newspapers and then asked them to publicize our results. And, and that helped. But you know, it takes, uh, like any other marketing, you, you must market it. ¿Ya lleva un año en el cargo? ¿Está contento? Yes, I'm content. We've made some changes. Uh, Of course, I'd like to make more changes and quicker changes, but like in anything else, when you have a, a democracy, we have to get it past everybody. But, but I think we're making some, some changes in the U.S. Uh, polo, and I'm happy with what we're doing so far. ¿Qué cambios le gustarían para 2019? Um, the big changes for 2019, of course, is the lowering of the handicap of the U.S. Open, the Gold Cup, and the C.V. Whitney. Uh, we're also uh, putting more stress on uh, uh, developing more polo clubs and prize money. We're going we're to put more prize money into every level. Uh, we're working on a plan now that if, uh, if a club raises X amount of dollars, the USPA will match that. And, uh, and have more prize money, maybe that'll bring more interest. Uh, we're hoping that will work. El, el 2019, piensa que va a ser un buen año para el polo de Estados Unidos. I think so. I think it's going to be a very good year for polo in the United States. I think, uh, again, through this awareness that we're trying to make people more aware, uh, I think we are going to have a better year. ¿Qué opina, qué, qué significa para el polo de Estados Unidos que Nick y Jared hayan jugado Palermo? Yes, it's everyone's dream to play on, on field number one. It's a great, great opportunity for both of them and to have, you know, two Americans in the same, same year. Uh, uh, it's just, this is the hallowed ground. This is the, the holy grail of polo. Once, once many, many years ago, I was playing in the Marlboro Cup. It was a 12 goal tournament and I got beat in the semifinals by a half a goal and my final game would have been on this field. I never got to fulfill that dream. My son, two years ago, got to play in the Stimulo here uh, on this field, and, and that was a big deal, but not, not anywhere as near the big deal or the, the, the apex of polo as Nick and, and Jared are getting to play here in Palermo now.
Okay, uh, Bob, first question is uh, your summary of uh, 2018 activities in the USPA. It was a very productive year for the USPA. Uh, uh, a lot of the work that we put into uh, last year's polo programs was to do with the governance of the United States Polo Association, amending our bylaws, constitution, and policies, updating them, changing uh, a lot of things that we felt were very important for the future of the association, and uh, in, in particular, um, some of the policies that address handicapping, um, the constitution and bylaws that address terms of our, of our directors, our board of governors, and um, uh, ways we manage our business and, and our association. What is the highlight of 2018 in uh, facts of playing? Well, I think that uh, one, the upset in the U.S. Open was, you know, a, a, an incredible highlight for polo. Um, a tremendous game for both teams, um, and it's hard to have an upset because, you know, you have a brilliant team who's being upset, and uh, and they they played phenomenally and and you know brought us great polo. On the other hand, you have a new team that no one's familiar with that's playing together for the first time, and they are able to come and beat a very well organized, long running team with many championships under their belt. In any sport, that's very exciting. And also having USPA players team. I mean, the, the US uh, uh, Open winning team has players developed by USPA. But by USPA, and you know, our team USPA program uh, is for young players, and it's for the development of young players. And um, you know, I, I hear a lot of people criticize the program. Of course, you know, no matter what kind of program you have, people have different ideas as to how you should run it. But I think uh, having Jared Zenni uh, as a testament to it's not only the program, but it's those who are in the program. Because you know, his determination uh, to be a better polo player, regardless of uh, who's helping, is, is, is what it takes to become a champion. When you have backing and support, it, it's only that much more productive. And for us to have young players like Jared is very rewarding because it, in, it motivates you to want to do more and to want to help more and, and see, see how it improves the individual and, and the sport in general. How did, you, how did you live as part of USBA and also as a Polo fan having here two American players playing Palermo? Of course we are thrilled you know to have two Americans and um, you know, Jared was here with, you know, the way he got into the, the be able to participate and qualify um, was amazing. And of course they didn't win, but they didn't come here to win, they came here for the experience. And I'm very proud of him and that entire team. But in the same token, um, you know, Nick and his success was amazing too. And I watched, I was fortunate to be here to watch Nick play last weekend. Uh, a very exciting game and uh, it, it just shows that I think um, international polo is, is changing in the same token we talk today quite often about the participation of the international players in the women's Argentine Open and I believe there's over 50 percent foreign players playing and in uh, the they had the subsidiary game for the women's Open on Monday and there was not an Argentine player on either of those two teams. And so I really think it shows that the importance of international polo and how we have to work together, all of us, it's the same difference whether it's, it doesn't matter the nationality, it's the same sport. And it's how do we help grow it, how do we help support it from country to country. And uh, I think this, this was a great testament to it, this, this Women's Open, and the door cracking for a couple of Americans to be able to get into the Argentine Open was huge. Okay. Let's see to 2019, what's the main goals of USPA? Well, we always have a lot of goals. Um, it's a big association and we have goals that are, that are different for different um, parts of the association. Obviously, um, 
the high goal is is quite different this year, and I think people are pretty familiar with that. But I'm extremely excited to have uh, 16 teams entering our Gauntlet Series, which is our three big tournaments at the 22 goal level, and then to have. Uh, the prize money of a potential to win a million dollars for a team to win a million dollars is uh, unprecedented in our sport, and I think it's um, it's a big part of what's attracted the 16 teams. Obviously, um, there was a big difference between what we've been doing in the 20 at the 26 goal level and dropping it to a 22 goal level. Uh, we're seeing a lot of different players, a lot of different team owners. Um, that we've never seen before at this level, which is extremely exciting. And we hope to continue to attract more teams, more players, um, American and foreign. It's also exciting to see the number of American players who are participating in the Gauntlet Series, as opposed to who were participating in the same three tournaments over the past several years. You talk about uh, big money in high goal. What about the low or middle goal uh, price money uh, from the USBA? We, we have a new program, and uh, I'm very excited that we have this program. Our strategic planning committee um, came up with this idea, and many there have been many of the board members talking about it. But what we're doing is we put a fund together of $400,000, and we're going to distribute that fund out to clubs as a match program um, So the way it, for prize money. So the way it will work is if a club has a tournament, and, it, and this is at any level, as long as it's a USPA tournament, it can be an arena tournament, it can be a women's tournament, it can be any level outdoor tournament, um, we will match up to $25,000. And you know, I'm anticipating that uh, most clubs won't raise $25,000 for one tournament, and there'll be more money to go around, but. Um, if they raise 5,000 and we give them five, then they have a $10,000 prize. If they raise 15 and we give them 15, they have a $30,000 prize. There, only, you know, there will be some restrictions that you have to have a certain number of teams playing in the tournament and that, because um, we don't want two teams where another tournament could have several teams. The idea is to stimulate polo and to stimulate USPA polo. We want to see the clubs, help the clubs attract more teams it's better for everybody. It helps the club. The players have more excitement because they have more competition. They have a prize that they're fighting for. So rather, if you make it to the trophy stand, rather than handed, be handed a trophy, you're actually handing it, being handed a check. And I think it's also great for the spectators because everybody loves to see teams in any sport, right? Going for money. You and I talked earlier about, you know, if you were watching television and you pass by watching a polo game that was just a polo game, or a polo game where they were playing for $50,000, or even a million dollars if it happens to be the finals of the gauntlet and someone qualifies. That's the excitement that we need to bring to the sport, that we're missing in the sport of polo, and we see it in all other sports. So I'm really excited at this new program. We don't know exactly how it'll pan out, but I have a feeling that it's gonna make some very exciting tournaments this year.